Hi, we're moving on now to the sacred texts of East Asia. In the previous lecture, we saw how Jainism seems to undermine some common assumptions. It's clearly a religion, but unlike most of the other traditions we'll encounter in this course, Jain identity is not primarily based on an established, widely accepted set of sacred texts. In this lecture, we're faced with nearly the opposite situation. Confucianism has a well-defined canon. In fact, it has two of them, the five classics and the four books. But Confucianism is often thought of as more of a philosophy than a religion. So perhaps we should begin with some definitions. Confucianism is a system of thought, how's that for a vague term, which originated in ancient China with Confucius, who lived from 551 to 479 before the Common Era. However, the English term Confucianism wasn't used until the 19th century, and it's not a direct translation from the Chinese. The Chinese don't name this school of thought after its founder, after Confucius, but they use the term Ru Jia, which means the school of scholars, or, or they may call it Wu Jiao, the teachings of the scholars. Confucius is an exemplary figure, but things don't exactly start with him. He was an inheritor and a, and a transmitter of an earlier cultural heritage, much of which was contained in the five classics. When we think about religion in the West, we often have in mind social groups that share in a broad family of characteristics, such as a belief in a god or gods, a revelation, a sense of the sacred, concepts of ultimate reality, especially if they include a supernatural realm, rituals, prayer, a moral code, and some notion of an afterlife and salvation. Not every religion has all of these. For instance, early Judaism had a relatively undeveloped idea about the afterlife. And although Jainism accepts the existence of gods, they're irrelevant to one's spiritual progress. Yet nevertheless, we tend to think that we can fairly easily distinguish religion from, say, philosophy. Confucianism, however, presents something of a puzzle. It contains traces of, the most, of most of the common elements of religion, but the emphases are different than what we might expect making it seem more like Epicureanism or Stoicism, which were two of the most prevalent philosophies in the Roman Empire. They both taught that happiness could be attained by limiting or, or restricting one's passions and desires. Well, we, we think of Stoicism and Epicureanism as philosophies now, but in ancient Rome, those were the people most likely to try to grab you in the marketplace, missionary-like, for a conversation about the meaning of life. Confucianism has a concept of an impersonal moral force called heaven, tian, which, which is not exactly a god, yet which sometimes rewards and punishes human behavior. At the same time, however, the basic religion in China from the earliest period has been ancestor worship, in which people pray to, and they make offerings to, and they seek favors from their deceased parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. The ceremonies of ancestor worship were incorporated into Confucian living, though they were not elaborated on theologically. For example, in a famous exchange, one of Confucius' students once asked about the worship of the ghosts and the spirits, and Confucius replied, We don't know yet how to serve men. How can we know about serving the spirits? And the, steward, the student pressed forward, What about death? And Confucius said, we don't know yet about life. How can we know about death? So Confucianism offers a strong moral code, a vision for living in harmony with the universe, rituals for dealing with unseen beings, divination, opportunities for awe and reverence, and even Confucian temples where offerings were made to the sage himself. But many of its tenets seem rather practical and this-worldly, with an emphasis on family and politics. They don't talk a lot about spirits in the afterworld. So is it a religion or a philosophy? And it could sort of go either way, which is exactly what happened. In the 17th century, Jesuit missionaries to China admired Confucianism and treated it as a philosophy or an ethical system that was compatible with Christianity. 
Thus, Chinese Christians could continue to study the Confucian classics and continue to participate in its rituals. Um, the Jesuits regarded ancestor worship not as idolatry, but as a means of honoring one's father and mother, as in the Ten Commandments. The Jesuits made considerable progress and even gained positions in the imperial court. On the other hand, Dominicans and Franciscans said, no, wait a minute, those are religious rites. And they insisted that Chinese converts had to choose between Christianity and Confucianism. The rites controversy, as it's called, went on for nearly a century, with several popes weighing in, as well as the Chinese emperor. But the end result was that Chinese Catholics were forbidden to participate in Confucian rites, and forbidden to participate in ancestor worship, which just about brought Catholic missionary work in China to an end. Then in the 19th century, at a time when China was much weaker compared uh, relatively to European societies, Protestant missionaries were less accommodating, though less accommodating than the Jesuits, certainly, though Western scholars were already beginning to develop the idea of world religions and to view Confucianism within that category as something worthy of respect. One key individual, both a missionary and a scholar, was James Legge. Legge was a Scotsman who served as the head of a Christian college in Hong Kong for nearly 30 years. Um, Legge began translating and publishing the Confucian classics while in China, and then in 1876, he was appointed as the first chair of Chinese language and literature at Oxford University. Four years later, Legge published a book called The Religions of China, Confucianism and Taoism Described, which put the teachings of Confucius firmly within the religion camp. During his 20 years at Oxford, Legge continued to revise and enlarge the scope of his translations. It, it was truly a stupendous achievement, and more than a century later, his versions of the Confucian classics are still widely used. At Oxford, Legg met another professor there, our old friend Max Mueller, and together they decided to publish some of Legg's translations of Confucian and Taoist classics as part of the sacred books of the East. And this, as much as anything, contributed to the notion that Confucianism could be considered on an equal footing with Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. Um, Legg eventually contributed six of those 50 volumes in Sacred Books of the East. So that's more than any other single translator. In the 20th century, Chinese scholars themselves started writing in English about Confucian texts, and they tended to treat them more as philosophy than religion. So it's gonna switch over a little bit. This was probably an attempt to make those ideas of, 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 of Chinese uh, civilization, of Confucianism, more attractive to Westerners but it also reflected attitudes in China, where successive governments in the 20th century did not count Confucianism as one of the five recognized religions. Those would be Taoism, Buddhism, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Islam. Yet eventually, Western scholars began to split the difference. One important study was titled Confucius, the Secular as Sacred. Um, it's written by a scholar named Herbert Fingeret, it's a sort of classic in, in Sinology. Um, it's not a very long book. It's actually well worth reading. And then Western textbooks also use terms like religious humanism to describe the tradition of Confucianism. Confucianism can certainly function like a religion, giving transcendent meaning and guidance to people's lives. And I'm comfortable calling it a religion with a suitably expansive definition. Keep in mind that in Asia, religions are not always mutually exclusive. People can adopt Confucian precepts and rituals for some aspects of their lives, while being Taoist or even Buddhist at other times. It's a different notion of religiosity than in the Abrahamic religions, where it would be impossible to simultaneously be Muslim and Jewish, or, or even Catholic and Protestant. One of the ways in which Confucianism is like what we might call a religion is in its use of sacred texts. From earliest times, Confucian scholars have been devoted to a collection of ancient writings that they regarded as profound, comprehensive, and uniquely authoritative, in which every word was significant. There were these, and these texts were the five classics, five Confucian classics, they're often called. Those are the odes, the documents, the rites, the changes, 
and the spring and autumn annals. These texts all preceded Confucius, along with a sixth classic on music, which was subsequently lost. And even though later scholars regarded Confucius as the editor or, or the commentator on these books, he probably didn't have a direct role in their production. It's just part of the, the cultural heritage of China that he was part of, and he and his school kind of specialized in this. Indeed, the final canonical forms of the, of the, the five classics were not established until sev several centuries after Confucius's death. But in the first century of the Common Era, during the Han Dynasty, the five classics became the basis for the Chinese civil service exams, and thus became the foundation of state ideology. So we'll begin with the first one, the Odes, which is also known as the Book of Poetry. This consists of 305 poems dating from the 10th to the 7th centuries BCE. They're divided into four sections, Eras of the States, Lesser Odes, Greater Odes, and Temple Hymns. And these include a number of sacrificial and ceremonial hymns, often praising royal ancestors. But the most interesting poems for modern readers are probably those in the heirs section, many of which are folk songs about courtship and marriage and agriculture, or they're songs that complain about military conscription and oppressive officials. The poems are generally in rhyming four-character lines, and they're rich in metaphor and nature imagery. The tradition is that Confucius selected these 300 or so songs from a much larger collection of 3,000. Okay, it's probably not true, but this for a long time is what uh, the Chinese saw as the connection between the Book of Odes and Confucius. And consequently, Confucian scholars or Chinese scholars have long looked for the hidden moral meanings that would have attracted Confucius' attention. Take, for instance, this ode, which seems clearly to be a love poem. It says, that the mere glimpse of a plain cap could harry me with such longing, cause pain so dire, that the mere glimpse of a plain coat could stab my heart with grief. Enough, take me with you to your home. Okay, clearly uh, it's a, a female voice uh, and, and she's smitten by a dashing young man in his handsome clothes. Generations of Confucian scholars, however, have read that poem and interpreted the emotion expressed there as anguish caused by the sight of someone dressed in inappropriate clothes during the time they should be mourning for their parents. So they're gonna work in these moral principles of filial piety. The documents, the second of these uh, five classics, is a collection of 58 speeches or edicts from the mythical sage kings Yao and Yu through the first three Chinese dynasties. So, so roughly from the 23rd to the third centuries BCE. The documents addresses matters of statecraft, including the notion of the mandate of heaven. That heaven, and remember that's that impersonal moral force that sort of oversees the world. Um, heaven can grant its seal of approval to a virtuous ruler. And then when his descendants over time become corrupt or oppressive, heaven will transfer its approval to a more worthy family and thereby authorizing them to rebel and to start a new dynasty. But there are generally warning signs that come to that, that old uh, decrepit uh, dynasty on the edge there. And those warning signs come in the form of natural disasters like floods or famines or eclipses. And those indicate when a royal house is starting to lose the mandate. One of the most famous episodes in the documents is the story of the metal bound coffer. In the late 11th century BCE, the admirable founder of the Zhou dynasty King Wu, one of the great sage kings in Confucianism, he fell terribly ill. And in response, his younger brother, known as the Duke of Zhou, secretly prayed to the ancestors that they would take his own life rather than taking the life of the king. The Duke of Zhou had his petition sealed up in a metal-bound coffer. But in the end, the ancestral spirits spared both men. Five years later, however, the king did die and his 13-year-old son ascended to the throne. There were rumors that the Duke of Zhou, this is now the uncle of the young monarch, would try to take advantage of his nephew's weak position and usurp the throne. So the Duke voluntarily withdrew for a period of three years. Heaven, however, indicated that something was amiss with a great storm that destroyed fields and overthrew trees, right? This is the way that heaven can sort of send its, its messages. 
And the court officers who saw these disasters were looking around for an explanation, and eventually they came upon and opened that metal-bound coffer. And inside, they found the written evidence of the Duke of Joe's self-sacrificing attitude many years before. They realized that he was, had been a good guy all along, and he was recalled to court where relationships were repaired, and the Duke of Joe has ever since been held up as a model of loyal service. Okay, those are the kinds of moral lessons that we might read in the documents. Both the odes and the documents were targeted by the first emperor of China in the famous burning of the books in 213 BCE. Okay, now the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, is the one whose tomb in, in the city of Xi'an housed those um, 7,000 life-size terracotta soldiers that you may have seen pictures of or, or may have even visited. Apparently, the first emperor was tired of being unfavorably compared to the illustrious sage kings of the past, like, like the Duke of Zhou, or, 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 well, he wasn't a king, but the, the kings Wan and Wu. And therefore, the first emperor wanted to get rid of all of the works of history and literature and philosophy so that history would begin with him. This is at least the story that Confucians told of their darkest hour. Um, when he, uh, the, the first emperor sort of rounded up all of those uh, texts and had them burned and even had some scholars who tried to protect them uh, buried alive. At least this is the, the myth. The reality is probably a bit more complicated, but many of the documents were indeed destroyed, or many of the copies of the documents and the odes were indeed destroyed at that time. When a new dynasty, the Han Dynasty, came to power in 202 BCE, um, a copy of the documents came to light that had been hidden by a scholar in the wall of his home. And this had been written in the contemporary style of Chinese script, the new text, they called it. So one of the first things that the, one of the things that the first emperor did during his short reign was he revised and standardized all of the Chinese characters that were used. So this text is written in these sort of new standard characters. There was also a copy of the documents that had been found in Confucius's old home that also had been sort of walled up or hidden there. And that was written in ancient styled characters. So it was called the old text of the characters before the, the script reform of the, of the Qin dynasty, of the first emperor. During the Han dynasty, and as I said, it begins in 202 BCE and then it goes to 220 CE, so about 400 years. During the Han dynasty, the new text school with its more religious ideas of Confucius as a miracle-working, uncrowned king was dominant, and the old text fell into dis to disuse, only to be rediscovered again in the fourth century of the Common Era. Eventually, the standard edition of the documents consisted of 33 new text chapters and 25 old text chapters. They sort of split the difference and combined what they could. If one of the marks of scripture is its ability to provoke crises of faith, the document quali qualifies. In the mid-18th century, brilliant Chinese textual scholars used the tools of philology to definitively prove that the old text chapters of the documents, which had been accepted as authoritative canon for 1,500 years, they were actually 4th century forgeries. And it came as a terrible shock to Chinese culture to try to figure out what that might mean for Confucianism or even for, uh, for Chinese civilization as a whole. We'll move on now to the third of the five classics, and that's the rites. This is a collection of three texts, the ceremonials, the Zhou rites, and the records of rites. All of these are compilations of traditions attributed to the early Zhou dynasty concerning proper government functions, ceremonies, <clears throat> decorum, and etiquette, along with interpretations of the meanings of various rituals. So to take the records of rites, for example, we find rules governing social visits, interviews with government authorities, and family interactions, along with rituals for coming of age ceremonies, uh, for marriages, funerals, mourning periods, sacrifices, banquets, and archery contests. There are also instructions for appropriate clothing, for seasonal activities, education, and court protocol. This information is presented through systematic descriptions, essays, dialogues, and historical narratives. So there's a lot there about how at least the governing class ought to act in their everyday lives in their official capacities. The rites texts present an idealized version of social interactions during the time of the sage kings. 
And, and they were probably compiled many centuries after the golden years of the early Zhou dynasty. And by the way, fragments from the lost classic of music seem to have been preserved as one of the chapters in the records of rites. To give you a sense of what all this might sound like, here are the opening lines from the records of rites. It says, Always and in everything let there be reverence, with the deportment grave as when one is thinking deeply, and with speech composed and definite. This will make the people tranquil. Pride should not be allowed to grow. The desire should not be indulged. The will should not be gratified to the full. Pleasure should not be carried to excess. So you can see a message there of moderation, sort of in general, and then these texts give lots of specific actions um, and expectations for, for social interactions. Some of the details of the, the rites texts were things that were only appropriate to ancient China, yet there are also bits of timeless wisdom. I like the following model presented in the chapter on education, where it says, in his teaching, he leads and does not drag. He strengthens and does not discourage. He opens the way, but does not conduct to the end. And I think what that last bit means is that a good teacher has to allow his students some space so that they can take some initiative themselves. That's where the best learning might happen. We'll talk much more about two particular chapters from the Records of Rights in the next lecture, since they become eventually two of the four books. Stay tuned for that a little bit later. Confucius, the master teacher of early China, once said, find inspiration in the odes, take your place through ritual, and achieve perfection with music. And remember, music is, was one, is, is a lost classic there. The five classics, or rather the early versions of the books that we now know as the five classics, were Confucius's primary textbooks. So far, we've talked about the odes, the documents, and the rites. We have time in this lecture for one more, the Spring and Autumn Annals, and then we'll have to say the last of the five, the classic of changes, for the next lecture. As a historian myself, the Spring and Autumn Annals is, oddly enough, both my favorite and my least favorite of the five classics. The Annals itself is not particularly appealing. It consists of short notices of events that were recorded in the small state of Lu, which is Confucius's home state, between 722 and 481 BCE, and they're often dated by season. So that's the spring and autumn part. I guess actually it would be the spring and summer and autumn and winter annals, but they shorted, shorted it down to just those, those two, spring and autumn annals. These are mostly quick notes about changes of rulers, about marriages, deaths, diplomatic visits, and battles between numerous feudal lords in the centuries immediately preceding Confucius. For instance, the first three entries in the annals dated to the first year of the reign of Duke Yin of Lu. So in 722 BCE, um, the first three entries read in their entirety. First, it was his first year, the spring, the king's first month. Number two, in the third month, the duke and, and Ifu of Zhu made a covenant at Mie. A covenant is a treaty that they signed. And third entry, in summer, in the fifth month, the Earl of Zheng overcame Duan in Yen. That's it. I mean, there, there's not much there. There are, however, some commentaries. There are two early commentaries, the Guliang and the Gongyang, that tried to decipher the moral judgments that they assumed Confucius had hidden within the text by analyzing exact terms that he used. But what makes the Spring and Autumn Annals wonderful is its earliest commentary, compiled about 300 BCE and attributed to Zuo Chouming. He was a court writer who supposedly lived about the time of Confucius. Mr. Zuo's commentary, um, this is what it's called, Mr. Zuo's commentary provides detailed historical narratives that explain those terse notices in the annals. And this is where all the interest comes from. So to return again to that first year where it says, in the summer, in the fifth month, the Earl of Zheng overcame Duan in Yan. The Zhuo Commentary has a long story about two princes, the older of whom was hated by his mother, apparently because there was a difficult childbirth. And she, I'm not sure why you would blame a child for that, but she never really forgives him for that pain and agony that she went through. 
So she, she hated the older son and she young, doted upon the younger prince. When the eldest son inherited the kingdom of Zheng and then became the duke there, his mother plotted with her younger son, Duan, to overthrow the duke, the older brother. And she herself offered to open the gates of the capital city to the rebel army. So there was a civil war with the Earl of Zheng overcoming, I guess he was an Earl, not a Duke, the Earl of Zheng overcoming Duan. And when his younger brother was safely out of the way, the Earl then banished his mother and he made a vow that he would never see her again until they would meet in the Yellow Springs, which is in the underworld. It was thought to be the, the place under the earth where, where the dead went. After a while, however, uh, the Earl regretted his vow. Uh, respect for parents or filial piety is, is a big deal in Chinese culture. When a guard at a banquet asked for the equivalent of a doggy bag so that he could share some of that delicious court food with his mother, the Duke said, I guess he's a Duke and, a, and an Earl here, you have, to, you have a mother to take things to. Alas, I alone have none. And when the guard heard the story of the vow, he said, well, why don't you dig a tunnel into the earth until you reach the springs, the yellow springs underneath, and then you could fulfill your oath by meeting your mother there. The grateful duke did just that. And as he passed through this tunnel that had been dug, he sang a few, long, a few lines of a song, and then his mother sang a few lines, and then they were happily reunited. Um, one of my graduate professors once suggested that the Duke may have been symbolically reenacting his passage through the birth canal with happier results this time. Okay. There are hundreds of such stories in the Zuo Commentary, which becomes sort of an encyclopedia of ancient China, with details not only about politics and warfare, but also about family life, gender relations, about ethics and ghosts and omens and ancestral spirits. The commentary probably dates to the late 4th century BCE, and may have originally been an independent history. But since it basically covered the same time period and the same events as the Spring and Autumn Annals, it looks like it was reorganized as a commentary on that book. So these events were attached to uh, entries in the Spring and Autumn Annals, and then consequently was immortalized by its association with one of the Confucian classics and studied intently by scholars and, and would-be uh, uh, candidates for the exam system ever after. So far, in the five classics, we've seen poetry, history, ritual, rules for living, and explorations of morality. It's an eclectic mix. But then again, all of those genres can be also found in the Hebrew Bible. So why then do we generally refer to the sacred texts of ancient Israel as scripture and the sacred texts of Confucianism as classics? Three explanations come quickly to mind. The first is that even though the Confucian classics often mention heaven and spirits and sacrifices, divination and so forth, they're not as directly focused on God or, or gods. Second, the texts of Confucianism don't claim to be revealed. They were always regarded as the writings of ancient sages, so men remarkably in tune with the patterns and harmonies of the cosmos, to be sure, but still human beings. And third, as far back as the second century BCE, the Confucian classics were intimately connected with state orthodoxy, imperial sponsorship, government education, and the civil service exams, precisely the sort of worldly connections that we in the West tend to treat as political rather than spiritual. Yet part of the problem is surely a simple matter of translation. The five primary texts of Confucianism began to be known as classics, or Jing, in the Han Dynasty. The word Jing refers to the vertical threads, or the warp, on a weaving loom, and hence carries the basic connotations of, of guidelines, rules, norms, continuity. A Jing is a text that is deemed authoritative and orthodox. When Buddhist sutras were translated into Chinese, they were labeled Jing as with the Lotus Sutra, which in Chinese is Fa Hua Jing. Indeed, the fact that Buddhism entered China in the first century of the Common Era with authoritative texts probably made it more acceptable to the Chinese, who were already used to the idea of a written canon. The scriptures of other faiths were also categorized as Jing, such as the Taoist Tao Te Jing, and the Bible, uh, which in Chinese is known as the Sheng Jing, or the Holy Scripture, 
And the Quran, which is translated as the Gulan Jing, a uh, Gulan is supposed to sound a little bit like Quran. The word Jing is the same in Chinese, and whether we translate it in English as classic or scripture, is mostly a matter of habit. Be prepared for some paradoxes as we continue the next time by talking about the fifth of the five classics, the changes, or the I Jing, which definitely starts as a religious handbook of divination and then is transformed into, into a philosophical treatise. While two of the four books, the Analects and, and the Mencius, are philosophical works that get redirected toward religious purposes by Neo-Confucians of the 10th century. So, classics or scripture, religion or philosophy, Chinese sacred texts challenge all sorts of Western assumptions, which is partly what makes them so interesting. We'll begin this lecture with the last of the five Confucian classics, the changes, or the I Jing. Let me spell this out for you because you may have seen it in, in one of two different ways. Nowadays in Pinyin, it's Y-I-J-I-N-G, but you may have seen it in earlier books as I-C-H-I-N-G. Both of those are ways of representing the Chinese characters I Jing into an, an English alphabet. The I Jing is considered by the Chinese to be the oldest and holiest of the classics, and it is by far the best known of them in the West. The I Ching is an ancient manual of divination, whereby one manipulates milfoil stocks, or, or later coins, much later coins, to derive a particular hexagram by which one can predict the future, or at least offer clues as to how a dynamic situation might be changing. The core text consists of 64 graphs of six stacked horizontal lines. Some of those lines are broken, and some of them are unbroken. And each of those graphs has a title and a short statement. And then there's a series of brief judgments on each of the six lines of the 64 graphs, the hexagrams, which are useful when specific lines are determined to be particularly powerful or unstable. There are 64 of these graphs called hexagrams, since that number represents every possible combination of broken or unbroken lines that are arranged into sets of, sets of six. Uh, so it's like two to the sixth power. In preparing for this lecture, I actually used some coins to generate an appropriate hexagram for this course. And as I threw those coins and saw how they came up and then did the, the manipulations that I needed to, I came up with a hexagram number 17, which is called sway or following. And it has, starting from the bottom, a solid line and then a broken line, a broken line, solid line, solid line, and then finally at the top is a broken line. The summary statement for this hexagram is following has supreme success. Perseverance furthers no blame, which seemed to suggest that if I were careful to follow somebody or something and then pushed ahead, this course might turn out okay, or at least not be a disaster. That very day, I took some of my lectures that I'd written over to a few of my colleagues with expertise in various religions for their critiques and comments, and following their advice has indeed saved me from several errors. The solid lines in the hexagram are thought of as yang, while the broken lines represent yin, in accordance with the ancient Chinese notion that the cosmos consists of two opposing forces that are manifest in all things. So yin and yang, uh, sometimes Americans say yin and yang. Notice that the relationship between yin and yang is more complementary than oppositional. It's not that one is good and the other is bad. It's more like the difference between high and low, or hot and cold, or, or male and female. Or in, in Chinese, the, the para paradigmatic polarity is between heaven and earth. So both of those are, are necessary parts of the whole, 
even though they stand in contrast with each other. Notice that Taoists are not the only people in ancient China who are talking about yin and yang. Confucians do it as well as do other philosophical schools. When I cast my hexagram, the bottom line was the only one that had reached the limits of yang. So it had a score of nine. There's ways that you can determine this with the coins. And so the line judgment was applicable, which says nine at the bottom, or nine at the beginning, that's the bottom, means the standard is changing. Perseverance brings good fortune. To go out of the door in company produces deeds. Which again seemed to suggest that I not try to write these lectures all on my own. Those are all of the lines that had particular significance in the hexagram that, that I made. But if the next line up had been a full yin line with a score of six, then the judgment on that line would have been six in the second place means if one clings to the little boy, one loses the strong man. And I have no idea what that might mean. Similarly, a six at the top line would have gotten this line text. He meets with firm allegiance and is still further bound. The king introduces him to the western mountain. Perhaps this gives you some idea of what to expect from the changes. There's a number of somewhat vague cryptic sayings associated with the various hexagrams and their individual lines. The Chinese have long ascribed the hexagrams, the statements, and the line texts to the founders of the Zhou Dynasty in the 11th century BCE. And in fact, the book does seem to be a compilation of divination lore from several centuries before Confucius. Personally, I have my doubts about whether the I Ching really taps into the underlying principles of the universe, but I do think that it actually works in a functional sense. There's something about focusing one's attention on a particular situation or a problem and then trying to relate it to cryptic statements, uh, such as those line judgments, and that can help you see things in a different way, or it can provoke new insights or solutions as you try to match the situation at hand to these, these sort of odd uh, 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 divination uh, uh, instructions that are given. Yet the changes is more than just a divination manual. Eventually, there were 10 appendices, or wings, that were added to the core text. These were commentaries. They were traditionally ascribed to Confucius, probably actually not written by him, but these explored cosmic patterns of change and transformation, and even suggested that the I Ching contained within its 64 hexagrams all the possible states of transition, and hence was a textual model or a microcosm of the entire universe. By learning to distinguish significant from trivial change, careful readers could prioritize their concerns and efforts, and they could learn to live in harmony with the inevitable ebbs and flows of the cosmos. These sorts of grand metaphysical claims generated intense interest throughout Chinese history, manifest in hundreds of detailed commentaries on the I Ching, on the classic of changes. And in the West, ever since Richard Wilhelm's German rendition caught the attention of the famous psychologist Carl Jung and was translated into English in 1950, the I Ching has enjoyed an almost mystical countercultural prestige. It's the only one of the five Confucian classics that can, can still be found in most American bookstores. With the canonization of the five classics in the Han Dynasty, there came a need to establish, preserve, and transmit authoritative versions of the text exactly. Okay. Canonization is only an approximate term here. Right? The selection of the, the Confucian text didn't come about by church council, but instead came by government fiat when the five classics were made the core of the official state curriculum in 136 BCE. Unlike in Hinduism, where there were rigorous methods of memorization, or in Judaism, with the amazing scribal quality control of the Masoretes, in China, this standardization of the text, this, this fixing of the exact words, was done by carving the classics into stone. Okay. Ordinarily, Chinese texts were written on narrow vertical strips of bamboo slips that were connected together with cords, something like uh, window shades that you might roll up. And this actually is why Chinese characters traditionally are written in lines from top to bottom, because they originally fit into those, those bamboo slips. 
In 172 of the Common Era, the emperor ordered a complete set of the stone classics for the Imperial Academy. So there were seven classics, um, the standard five, plus the Analects of Confucius, we'll talk about that in a moment, and the brief classic of filial piety. Those seven texts were carved onto 46 steles, each a little over eight feet high and about three feet wide. It took nine years to carve the 200,000 characters. Um, it was thought that those stele were lost, and then in 1980, 96 fragments were discovered. Students at the Imperial Academy would not only step outside and then consult the stone texts, they could take rubbings on them on paper, which is a process similar to that used in woodblock printing, which was invented in China in the ninth century. After the collapse of the Han Dynasty in the third century of the Common Era, Confucianism, which had been closely associated with the imperial government, fell into decline, while Taoism and Buddhism became more prominent. In the Tang Dynasty, with the reunification of China under centralized rule, Confucianism began to make a comeback, and the five classics were again carved into stone in 837, along with several supplemental texts. Um, there were two more rites texts and two more commentaries on the annals. And then there was also the Analects of Confucius, the Filial Piety Classic, and the Arya, which was an early dictionary, making 12 texts in all. So some 650,000 characters were carved onto 114 large stele, which you can still see in the Forest of Steles Museum in Xi'an. Eventually, the Book of Mencius was added to make a 13th classic. So from the 12th century on, it was common to talk about the 13 classics of Confucianism, which incorporated both the original five classics and then the four books that we'll be talking about in a moment. Confucianism in the Tang Dynasty and the succeeding Song Dynasty, so that's from the 10th to the 13th century, was not quite the same as that of the Han Dynasty. Buddhism had influenced Chinese sensibilities and the new Confucianism, which Westerners have dubbed Neo-Confucianism, was much more interested in the ultimate nature of reality and humanity. And it was aimed at pursuing a program of self-cultivation and inner spirituality, as much as gaining the historical knowledge necessary to pass the exams and become a government official. There was, at this time, a lot of interest in the cosmological interpretations of the classic of changes. Neo-Confucianism has even more of the qualities that we typically associate with religions than did the original Confucianism of the Warring States era. The most influential figure in Neo-Confucianism was a scholar named Zhu Xi, and he lived from 1130 to 1200. He championed a metaphysical theory in which everything is a combination of Li, which is principle, and Qi, vital energy. And this energy in its heavier, heavier forms is, is matter, as some translations call it congealed energy. So there's principle, a sort of ideal blueprint for being a, a ruler or a mother or even a mountain or a river. Okay. Actual rulers and mountains are all different from each other because of the particular chi that makes them up, though they share the same li, the same basic pattern. This theory is important for two reasons. It offers an analysis of the nature of the cosmos that could compete with Buddhist philosophy. It was sophisticated and had some, some interesting ideas about ontology and, and metaphysics. And then the second reason it's important is it provides an ethical program for living. One can purify one's actions and emotions in order to bring them into harmony with the near perfect principle that's within us all. So according to Neo-Confucianism, human nature is naturally good. Everyone has this li of being a human being, this, this perfect pattern within them. And it's our job to recapture that innate goodness through study, self-discipline, and quiet sitting, which is a practice that's quite similar in some ways to Buddhist meditation. By doing so, one can follow the way, uh, that is the Tao of heaven. Keep in mind that Confucians talk about the Tao just as Taoists do. In Chinese, in fact, Neo-Confucianism is known as Tao Xue, the teaching of the way, or Li Xue, the teachings of, of principle. 
But given China's long-standing reverence for ancestors and for the past and the legendary sage kings, it was usually not effective to present one's ideas as new and, and revolutionary. So instead of Jushi saying, you know, here are my ideas, they are unprecedented, they've never been heard of before, he instead claimed to have recovered the long-lost original meanings of the Confucian texts. Though rather than the five classics, he urged his students and followers to concentrate their efforts on the four books. And the four books are the Analects, the Mencius, the Great Learning, and the Constant Mean. Okay, those last two texts, the Great Learning and the Constant Mean, were originally chapters from the Records of Rites. Mastery of one or, or two of the five classics had long been a path to success in the civil service exams and government office, since those ancient texts were thought to hold the keys to solving contemporary social and political processes, or, or actually contemporary social and political problems. Um, and you could look to the precedents of the past, remember how it was done in the golden age of the early Zhou dynasty. But Zhu Xi realized that the four books were shorter, easier to read, and more directly applicable to personal moral improvement and inner spirituality than the five classics had been. So Zhu Xi's elevation of those four texts was controversial during his lifetime. But then in 1315, more than a century after Zhu Xi's death, the Mongols, who at the time had taken over China and were trying to recruit Chinese to work as officials under them, the Mongols restored the civil service exams and started testing students on their knowledge, not of the five books, not of the five classics, but of the four books and Jushi's commentaries on them. For the next 700 years, until the abolition, the discontinuation of the state exams in 1905, the four books were the foundation of the official curriculum. The exams were the primary route to social mobility and respectability, and every exam candidate, along with nearly every school child, had to memorize the four books. So together they comprised some 50,000 characters, making them about two-thirds the length of the Quran. As, it, as the five classics declined in importance in late imperial China, and were reserved mostly for specialized scholars, the four books became much more important among sort of regular educated people, and they were also widely studied in Japan, in Korea, and Vietnam. In other words, Neo-Confucianism became an international movement. Jushi would have been delighted. He encouraged his students to recite the four books, to keep them continually in mind, and to strive to apply them in their lives. They were treated virtually as scripture, though the ultimate goal wasn't heaven, but rather to become a sage, to become someone at peace, in harmony with the cosmos, and embodying the highest moral standards. For these reasons, Jushi wanted his students to begin with the shortest and the simplest of the four books, The Great Learning, where the goal of study was clearly self-cultivation rather than success in the exams and, and, and success as, a, as an official in the government. Um, this book, and it's actually more of a pamphlet, begins with a few paragraphs attributed to Confucius, followed by ten short passages of commentary credited to Zengzi, one of Confucius's first disciples. So Confucius's words that, that start out the great learning include the following exhortations. He said, Knowing where to, where to come to rest, one becomes steadfast. Being steadfast, one may find peace of mind. Peace of mind may lead to inner serenity. Things have their roots and their branches. Affairs have their beginnings, have a beginning and an end. One comes near the way in knowing what to put first and what to put last. From the son of heaven, that's the emperor, on down to commoners, all without exception should regard self-cultivation as the root. In other words, there should be a spiritual goal and an organized plan for one's studies, right? From, from first, from beginning to the end. And the great learning goes on to provide a step-by-step -step strategy. Okay, so listen to these steps and then, and then wait for the time when you're gonna get to the end of all this. So it says, the ancients who wish to illustrate illustrious virtue throughout the kingdom first ordered well their own states. Wishing, well, wishing to order well their states they first regulated their families. Wishing to regulate their families, they first cultivated their persons. 
Wishing to cultivate their persons, they first rectified their hearts. Wishing to rectify their hearts, they first sought to be sincere in their thoughts. Okay, you, we're still waiting for to get to the basis, the, the fundamental thing here. Wishing to be sincere in their thoughts, they first extended to the utmost their knowledge. Such extension of knowledge lay in the investigation of things. Okay, and that's where it bottoms out. That's the ultimate uh, goal, or that's the basic goal, is the investigation of things. And then from that, one can work your way out to self-cultivation and your family and the state and the world being put in order. That investigation of things was defined by Jushi as examining the perfect primordial principle, the, the Li, that all of those things were meant to conform to. The next text in Jushi's streamlined educational curriculum was the Analects of Confucius. And he was right about putting that text at the beginning. The Analects is a great place to start one's study of Confucianism. It consists of 20 chapters of aphorisms attributed to Confucius, uh, or, or, there, or some brief dialogues and maybe some anecdotes about his life. The book seems to have had its origin with his students, who after Confucius's death, wanted to record some of their favorite sayings or, or stories about their beloved teacher. The English title, Analex, which we owe to James Legg's translation, is from a Greek word meaning a selection. The Chinese title, Lun Yu, means conversations. Confucius's engaging, inspiring personality really does seem to come through in his back and forth with students and, and government officials about education, ritual, literature, history, wealth and poverty, statecraft, friendship, and ethical behavior. He covers lots of, of, of topics. Um, they're pretty much in random order as well. They're sort of all mixed up together. Confucius is generally enthusiastic and generous, yet there are also times when he's frustrated at his inability to secure appropriate employment himself. Uh, he actually went, he had interviews with numerous uh, rulers looking for employment and, and never really was able to find the kind of government job that he thought he was, that would be appropriate for himself. So he was disappointed in that, and he's nearly in despair at the death of his favorite student when, when that happens. You get a sense of, of Confucius's, what he cares about, and, and his sort of highs and lows of his life. Confucius develops the technical terms of humaneness, refinement, righteousness, filial piety, the noble person, moral force, and the way. Those are all themes or terms that come up again and again but they're not in, in a systematic fashion. The reported conversations, as I said, seem to be in, in a random order, and, and ever the teacher, Confucius explains things one way to one student and differently to another student. He, he tailors his ideas to the capacities and temperaments of individual learners. So students may ask the same question, uh, tell me about filial piety or something, and he'll tell one thing to one student and something else, something slightly different to another. Confucius also tends to offer examples and illustrations rather than rigorous definitions of the kind we might find in, say, Aristotle. So later readers have had to go through, compare, had to go through the text comparing various statements um, on, on topics, on the same topics, to try to get at the heart of Confucius's teachings. And that's given rise to a great body of commentary and competing interpretations. But the fact that Confucian thought can be reconstituted in a variety of ways, has allowed it to be continuously relevant in widely different er eras, as Jushi discovered. It's a text that you can go into with, and whatever your particular questions are, you can find answers to that, even as the questions change over centuries. The Analex offers ideas that are, for the most part, practical and understandable. It's fun to read, and it's eminently quotable. I can give just a few favorites, starting with the famous opening lines. The master said, and this is always Confucius, the master said, to learn and at due time to practice what one has learned. Is that not also a pleasure? To have friends come from afar, is that not also a joy? To go unrecognized, yet without being embittered, is that not also to be a noble person? Another example. The master said, a clever tongue and fine appearance are rarely signs of goodness. You can see these sort of proverbial nature of these. Another, Zhu Gong asked about the noble person. Okay, what, what is he like? And Confucius said, he acts before he speaks, and then he speaks according to his action. 
Another, the master said, walking in a group of three, I'm sure to have teachers. I can pick out the good points and follow them, and the bad points and change them in myself. The master said, how dare I claim to be a sage or a benevolent man? Perhaps it might be said of me that I learn without flagging and teach without growing weary. Okay, you can see how these just sort of stack up and you can find these um, uh, relevant in many points to, to sort of our own lives. Oh, I, I can't resist, let me give you one more. In education, there should be no class distinctions. Um, in the Analects, Confucius is clearly regarded as a role model. So there are also brief descriptions of the way that he performed ancestral sacrifices, or how he asked questions when he was in a new place, or even how he fished, or how he sat on a mat. And we'll see similar traditions about Muhammad in the Hadith in a later lecture, where Muslims are looking to, to Muhammad's own life and actions for uh, guidelines or a model for how to act. Students who are reading the Analects as a moral guide, that is, as Jushi recommended, will come away with a number of attitudes. Um, in so many different ways, the Confucian Analects want to encourage respect for authority, whether parents or teachers or rulers. Um, they want to encourage reverence for the past, a love of learning, preference for nonviolent reform, for moral courage and exactness in dealing with others. The third of the four books is the Mencius, which is both the name of a book and also the name of a person. Um, in this case, Confucius's most prominent successor, who lived from 372 to 289 BCE, nearly two centuries after Confucius, or, or about the time of Plato. The Mencius has seven chapters, and each chapter is divided into two parts. And rather than the brief aphorisms and exchanges that characterize the Analects, the Mencius presents more extended discourses and reports of advice that Mencius gave to rulers, or, or it reports debates that he had with his philosophical opponents. As a result, this later text clarifies many points that have been left somewhat vague by Confucius. In the Mencius, you really start to get philosophical argumentation. For instance, Mencius argues at length that human nature is inherently good and that evil comes when people ignore their basic impulses of compassion, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom. Okay, mentions this idea that human nature is naturally good. You can see how Jushi sort of grabs onto that because that seems to fit with his idea of Li, this principle of, of, of being human. One of Mencius's most famous illustrations of the goodness of humanity is his observation that people instinctively feel, feel alarm or distress when they see a child who's about to fall into a well. Okay. Everyone will have that sort of gasp, that, that, that sort of feeling of alarm. Now, not everybody runs to the rescue, so it's possible to suppress those feelings, but that sort of compassion comes naturally to humanity.